morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, and then verses 18 through 28. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. Pick it up in verse 19. Now this was John's testimony. When the, the Jews of Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was, he did not fail to confess, but freely uh, confessed, I am not the Christ. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the desert. Make straight the way for the Lord. Now some Pharisees who had been sent questioned him, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize with water, John replied. But among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the thongs of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. This all happened in Bethany, on the other side of the Jordan, where John was baptized. And the Lord blessed reading of this word. Several years ago, I helped a friend move into an apartment. And I helped him by, by agreeing to, to drive the truck and, and pull a trailer that had all of his stuff in it. His stuff was, was piled up. We had a tarp over top of it and, and a web of, of, uh, of ropes and bungee cords to keep it all secure. The pile on the back of this trailer, it was high enough that I couldn't see out the back window of the truck so that the mirror inside didn't be no good at all. It had to depend on the side mirrors. And my friend, he was riding in the passenger seat beside me. He was giving me directions. This was before we, we used GPS units. So we were just trucking along and struck up a good conversation. The problem is, somewhere along the line, my friend got so caught up in the conversation that he quit paying attention to where we were going, as if I knew. And then at the last minute, he, he spotted our exit and he told me to turn right. Well, I, instinctively, I put on my blinker. I, I put on my right turn signal to, to let everybody know that I was planning on turning right. I hit the brakes, I slowed down, and, and I, I took my exit. But uh, just as soon as I start hitting the brakes and slowing down, this little sports car comes speeding up uh, beside me, blowing his horn. He had been riding in my blind spot, didn't know he was back here. Yeah, he was riding too close. But I, I used my turn signal, so I gave him plenty of warning. If he got caught short, it was his own fault. It kind of irritated me. Then about five miles later, we finally get to my, my friend's new apartment. I back the trailer in so we could unload. I was glad to be off the highway. Then when I was walking to the back of the truck, something caught my eye. What's that dangling from the tongue of the trailer? Oh, it's the, the hookup to the trailer lights. It was sitting there dangling. My friend forgot to plug it in. So no wonder that guy blew his horn at me. Now I had done my job. I'd flipped that little lever. I'd put on my turn signal. But he'd never seen it. Because the turn signal wasn't connected to the turn signal lights. Uh, unless it's connected to the lights, that little lever on the side of your steering wheel, well, it's completely useless. We read in Scripture that John came preaching in a dark time when people needed light, in a time when people needed direction. And, uh, and his radical preaching, it attracted a crowd, it attracted attention. And people, they found their way out to the desert. They found their way to John. And by finding John, they were finding their way to God. It was through John's preaching that they were getting excited about something that God was doing uh, in their midst. Something that God was doing for them. And John the Baptist, he was like a turn signal. Make straight uh, paths in this curvy wilderness. And here's how you do it. That's what John would preach. When the way looks crooked, turn. When you find yourself living in sin, turn. And some people got so caught up in John's revival, well, they got confused about John. They thought that, that John, that he was the, the end-all answer. They, they followed John. They wanted to be John's disciple. 
And uh, around the time when this gospel was written, there was a, a sect that had been formed after John was martyred. And they were still called themselves disciples of John, and they, they wondered, was John the Messiah? And I think that's what this part of the scripture is trying to clarify. Because there were several followers of Christ who started out as John's disciples. Several, several people started out with John and then followed Jesus. And, uh, and one of them we read about in scripture is a, is a Jew named Apollos. We read about him in the book of Acts. And he had a grasp of who Jesus was, but he was still a little confused. Acts 18.25 says that uh, it says he had been instructed in the way of the Lord and spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he only knew the baptism of John. He only knew the baptism of John. And then uh, the next verse explains that Priscilla and Aquila, when they invited uh, them into to their home, and most likely this was a home church, and so as a husband and wife, they sat down with him, and it says that they began to explain things to him more accurately. So there were those people who were confused about John the Baptist, about his role in the kingdom. There were those who thought he was the light. There were those who thought that John was the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one. But the problem is, John the Baptist, he was just a turn signal switch. John the Baptist was the turn signal lever but he wasn't the turn signal light. It was written concerning John the Baptist that he came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. And then in our Gospel reading, we hear John explaining this himself to those who would mistake him for the light. He, he freely confesses, I am not the Christ. I'm not the Messiah. I'm not the one that you've been waiting for. I'm just the, the, the turn signal leader. I'm the one who's pointing you to the one you've been waiting for. I'm the one who, who's going to help you see the light. But without the light, well, I'm just useless. And unless John is connected to the light, then, then, then he points to nothing. If, if Christmas morning hadn't have happened, well, then, then there would be no purpose for John's ministry. Unless John is connected to that light, he points to nothing. And, and, and if Jesus had to come to be baptized by him, then he preached for nothing. If Christmas morning hadn't have come, well, then John would have been just as useless as those trailer lights. Because his whole mission, his whole purpose, was to point people to Jesus. And if he, if he hadn't been connected to the light... <coughs> Well, then, then his whole mission, his whole ministry would have stopped short. And he would have caused a 20-car pileup out there in the desert. But the good news is that the light did enter the world. The light entered the world on Christmas morning. And because, because Jesus came, John's job was complete. He had served his purpose. John pointed to the light. And that light blinked for the whole world to see. When Jesus came, they no longer uh, you know, needed John the Baptist because they could see for themselves that the lever had done its job and pointed people, pointed the world to Jesus. And now Jesus, He was the light. Jesus, He lit up like a turn signal light for the rest of the world, giving direction to the rest of the world. But the problem is today, we don't have enough John the Baptist out there. Now think about the way people drive. A lot of people don't use turn signal lights, do they? They just go where they want to go. They don't worry about it. And then, then you've got those who, who try, like I did, and maybe they have faulty wire. But for whatever reason, there are a lot of people out there not using their turn signal lights. And as a result, drivers, well, they, they're they wondering which way to go. Many drivers are, are wandering aimlessly, just trying to, to avoid a, an accident or a catastrophe with no clear direction. We need more turn signal lights. And in Matthew 5.14, Jesus gives a job to his followers. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. We have all been commissioned 
to be termed signalites. We've all been commissioned, just like John the Baptist, to point people to the light that came into this world. And Jesus says it is foolish to have such a powerful light and hide it. It's a shame to have access to such a powerful light and then hide it under a bowl. It's a shame to have access to such direction-giving light and not turn it on. Just like it's a shame to confuse every driver out there on the highway by not using your turn signal light. So what kind of lights are you setting out? Now this is the season of lights, isn't it? I think the, the power company gets about as excited over Christmas as a five-year-old boy. But they don't care what's under your tree. They care what's on your tree. They care what's around your tree and on your bushes and dangling from your gutters. Now when you think about this scripture being an Advent text, whether we read it Christmas time, well it seems fitting that we would celebrate the light who came into the world by setting up lights. But there is a problem. The problem is that as soon as Christmas is over, those lights are going to come down. As soon as, as Christmas is over, well, we're going to stop burning those lights and we're going to put them back up in our attic. Well, what that means is that our Christmas lights, as, as pretty as they are, they're still a poor witness to the light that came into the world. Because the light that came into the world on Christmas morning is here to stay. The light that came on Christmas morning gave direction and a hope to everyone. And not just one month out of the year, but for all time. So we need to be careful. We need to be careful when we put those lights back in our attic. We need to be careful that we don't confuse our Christmas lights with Christmas. Because if we're not careful, when we put those lights away, we might leave our faith up there too. We, when we unplug those lights, we may become unplugged. Unplugged from Jesus, unplugged from the church, unplugged from worship and prayer. And if that happens, if we set our faith aside and we set it up there in the attic with those lights to collect dust, well, then, then, then we become just as worthless as turn signal lights that are connected to the switch. We flip the switch, but nothing happens. Now, just as John the Baptist, just as he pointed people to Jesus, it's our job for this generation to also point people to Jesus. John flipped on his turn signal so the whole world would know. Jesus came into this world. And this Christmas, we should also welcome Jesus into this world by pointing others to Him. Now, we, we search our, our sale ads and, and we search the shopping malls for that perfect gift. But don't you know that the perfect gift came into this world 2,000 years ago? The greatest gift that you can give anyone this Christmas is to introduce them to Jesus Christ. And our witness it begins with ourselves, with our attitudes, with how we present Christ to others. Now, as you may have figured out when I was preparing for this sermon, I spent a lot of time driving in my car, thinking about what I was going to preach, how I was going to preach. And while I was driving around this week, I thought about what John the Baptist had to say. Part of his witness was making it clear that he was not the Christ. Not me, but that guy over there. Not me, but this, this guy that you don't even know yet. He's, he's the Messiah. And he's so much bigger and better than me that I'm not even worthy enough to untie his shoelaces. Then a couple chapters later, John would look at his own disciples, his own followers, and he would say, I must decrease, he must increase. So I was driving down the road thinking about that message of John, wondering how I should preach it. And I stopped at a red light. And on the back of the minivan, right in front of me, was a bumper sticker. A, a, a little oval, a little black oval with, with white letters on it. And it plainly stated, not I, but Christ. Well, that's it. That's what, what John the Baptist was trying to say. The beginning of our witness, it begins with giving credit where credit is due. Not I, but Christ. We witness to Christ by acknowledging to the world that, that everything we, we have, everything we can do, everything that we have accomplished, it's not because of us. It's because of Christ who lives within us. But a lot of times, instead of making that statement, a lot of times we become a hindrance to God's light. 
We, we, we allow ourselves to get in front of that mirror, to stand in the way. We don't witness like we should. We don't witness because, well, we worry about what people might think of us. We worry about how we might come across to others. If I tell them I'm a Christian, well, are they going to start avoiding me? What's going to happen if I invite them to come to church? We worry about what people think. We worry about what, what our, our co-workers at work will think of us. What will my boss think? What will my friends say? Sometimes we don't witness to other people because we allow our own issues to get in the way. We don't witness because we think to ourselves, well, I'm not good enough. We let our own insecurity silence us. Oh, I would tell people that I'm a Christian, but I, I have this sin that I'm struggling with. And, and I don't feel like I'd be a good witness right now. Well, it's good that, that you, you feel convicted over, over that behavior or whatever it is that you want to change. That's good. But quit using that as an excuse for not doing your job. Quit using that as an excuse for, for, for getting out of pointing people to the light. Because we read in Scripture that we all sin. We all fall short. And look at the life of Paul. He talks about his own struggles. Remember when Paul complained about the thorn in his side? He, he explains it, that sometimes he would do the very thing that he didn't want to do. Paul struggled too. And yet he was one of the greatest witnesses of the early church. Now we should try to avoid sin and temptation. We should pray to the Holy Spirit that the Spirit would transform us, would help us through those dark times. But never let the fact that, that we are all a work in progress, never let that fact stop you from, from telling others about Christ. Because you never know. The, the, the person that you're witnessing to, they may be struggling with the very same thing. And they may listen to you, someone who's struggling with them. They may listen to you before they listen to me. They may listen to you before they listen to a pastor who they put up on a pedestal and view as perfect. <laughs> and let me tell you, pastors aren't perfect. The world may expect us to be. But I'm going to let you in on a little seat. Pastors struggle with sin too. If being perfect, if that was a requirement for spreading the gospel, well then we'd all be in trouble. Because I don't know who would be out there carrying all this work. It comes down to this. The way we witness to the world is by getting out of the way. By getting out of the way and allowing God's light to shine through us. Not I, but Christ. That's what the bumper sticker said. And that's how we let our light shine. By getting out of the way. By setting aside all of our excuses and allowing God to work through us. And this Christmas season, this is a great opportunity to invite people to church. People are more receptive to church at Christmas time. At Christmas Day, they remember their childhood. People become more nostalgic. They, they, they remember their childhood, and if they went to church as a child, well, then they may miss it a little bit. They may want to come back here. So, invite them to church. And Christmas has a way of bringing families together. So why not use, uh, use that opportunity? Families that want to do things together as a family. So make the suggestion that part of, of their, their family time include worshiping together in church this Christmas season. And encourage them to, to celebrate the real meaning of Christmas by worshiping in God's house. And then you know as good as I do that there will be people here that we don't see the rest of the year. There will be people here that come out for special Christmas uh, and worship services. But that's just another opportunity. That's another opportunity to let your, your light shine so they can see what a difference church is making in your life. So be encouraging to them. Be encouraging to let, the, uh, you know, to let, let their light shine as well. Encourage the light that you see in them. Encourage them to let that light shine more than just once a year, more than just one month out of the year. Encourage them to celebrate Christmas every day of their life by letting their light shine. Don't let them put Jesus uh, up in that attic with their Christmas lights. Encourage them to share in the festival of lights all year long. Now, at Christmas time, we celebrate Jesus coming into the world. This Christmas, let's hope that Jesus enters the world through us. May our lives 
May our lives be the road to lead someone to Bethlehem. May our actions be the turn signal that, that, that directs people through the crooked roads in life and leads them to Jesus. May our good deeds be the mirror that reflects the lights that are up ahead. And may our prayers be the wires that keep us connected to the source of light. May Jesus enter the world this Christmas season through us. May Jesus come into someone else's life because we pointed them to Jesus. Because we took up our role. May we be John the Baptist to someone that we care about this season. May we be like John the Baptist. And all we have to do is get out of the way. Get out of the way and let Jesus come into this world. Not I, but Christ. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for calling us together as a church. And as we prepare this Christmas season to celebrate how you came into this world 2,000 years ago, may we celebrate that by sharing that good news to others. May we celebrate Christmas by watching you enter the world again through us. May we watch you enter into the hearts and minds of those that we care about as we introduce people to your saving grace. Lord, I pray for all of our, our worship uh, opportunities, for all of our programs, that you may use each and every one of those as a way to direct people to your love and grace. And as we, as we prepare to leave this, this church building this morning, may we carry your light with us. May your light reflect in us and through us and around us. May people come to know you because they can see the difference that you've made in our lives. Help us all to be better witnesses. And Lord, I pray for, for that person here who's hearing this message and maybe they've never made that decision never made the decision to accept that light into their life. To hear the words of John the Baptist. To turn. To repent. To turn to you and ask forgiveness. Lord, I pray that this season, that this would be the time that they make that decision. To accept you into their heart. To follow you with their life. To follow you in baptism. Just as you were baptized by John. Or Lord, maybe there's some people here today who, who feel at home here, who are glad to be worshiping and celebrating Christmas with this church family, but they've never made that official transfer of membership. They've never moved. And Lord, I pray that, that this would also be a season when they would feel comfortable in making that decision and officially becoming a part of us as we as we celebrate together. May our church family continue to grow. These things we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our most precious Savior. Amen.